before I ask the uh, the whole, can I <clears throat> ask you to uh, to explain to us uh, the Kingdom of Denmark has many Arctic hats. You have the Kingdom of Denmark hat, and then there's the Greenland hat, and the Faroe Islands hat. The Prime Minister of Faroe Islands will speak later on. And then, as we saw earlier today, there is the European Union hat. And I remember when I met President Putin some years ago, and uh, uh, somehow we started talking about whether the European Union should be an observer state in the Arctic Council. And Putin said, how many chairs does Denmark want? <laughs> <clears throat> and then he listed, you know, Kingdom of Denmark, Greenland, Faroe Islands, and then the European Union chair. How do you, as the foreign minister of Denmark and the government of Denmark, uh, manage all this balancing act, uh, which must be very complicated. Uh, every, everyone else here just represents one country, in a, in a way. Uh, and uh, I think all of us would be very interested to, to hear from your practical experience. I don't need a theoretical answer about the constitutional position of all this. But as a foreign minister, day to day, year in, year out, how do you juggle all these different balls or hats? Uh, well, yeah. Well, thank you. I think it's an excellent question, uh, and I could talk all night uh, yeah. <laughs> about it. But no, I, I would just say, firstly, I think that um, each of us uh, who are represented in many places, I think we are living in a world, and especially when it comes to Arctic policies, where we need to cooperate. Mm. And if we have the same uh, course of direction, uh, and I hear thinking about climate change, sustainable economic development, and that's also why I alluded to uh, the Arctic Council, the vision for 2030, the action plan that was adopted here in Reykjavik on the Icelandic, uh, I think, uh, very sovereign, uh, good, uh, very um, skillful chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So we have a direction and we have an architecture of how we cooperate with each other. And for me, as a foreign minister of Denmark, I think the most important that we respect people and the different livelihoods and different competences and right to self-determination of people uh, here. That's why I'm always emphasizing as, uh, that, in, for example, with Greenland or Faroe Islands, which are part of the unity of the realm or the Kingdom of Denmark, that the aspirations of their governments, what they want to develop, uh, <coughs> is something we support. Uh, I support it very wholeheartedly also um, uh, the welcoming and reopening of the uh, US uh, consulate in Nuuk, and also now the EU is opening um, a representation in, in Nuuk as well, for example, to strengthen the cooperation with, with partners who are uh, also for Denmark the most essential, both economic and security partners. US is our prime uh, security ally. Uh, we all in our region, in that part of the region, we, we, uh, our prosperity is, is so much linked to more than 70 years of NATO membership uh, and that we have established this foundation that has given room for growing our economies and our trade and our interactions. So, so I really welcome that, that uh, the government in Greenland and Faroe Islands, they, they want to diversify, they want to be visible, uh, they want to show uh, the world that they, they are strong and they want to develop trade, investments, tourism, uh, sustainable expo exploitation, and Denmark supports that. And that's for me a modern way of, of working together, uh, three parts, uh, uh, of a kingdom, in this case, in Denmark. So I, I believe in this, and, um, and very practically, we have uh, established uh, good relations between the three parts of the Danish kingdom, uh, very practical relations. We have ongoing meetings and, and, and look into the same challenges together, and I firmly believe if we stand together as small nations, uh, we can uh, be much stronger. Great. Thank you very much. So let's take some questions. Yes, there's one here in the in the middle of the hall. Yes. Thank you. I'm Lisa Lotte Otgard from the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and Hudson Institute in DC. I would like to return to the geopolitics 
uh, now that you mentioned NATO, and ask two questions. The, the Greenland representative mentioned that you had agreed to give Greenland and the Faroe Islands a larger role uh, in Arctic issues. What will that matter for security policies coming out of the Kingdom of Denmark? What kind of role will they have? You mentioned NATO, and a lot of the Arctic nations are NATO uh, members or partners, and they're very active. But NATO doesn't really itself have a big role. What role if, do you see for NATO in the Arctic in future? Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for that question. First of all, uh, the, the whole principle that guides also my own government is we are together, the three parts of the kingdom, Greenland, Faroe Islands, and Denmark, on common issues. So when there are security challenges in, in the Arctic, then we deal with it together and we are working uh, on an equal footing with this. Well knowing that we have uh, the Danish constitution that is the, the legal framework for, for, our, um, uh, for our unity of the realm. But we work together and we work in partnership and we face the challenges together. We share intelligence, we share analysis, we discuss. And I have personally, um, you know, uh, since I took office two and a half years ago as foreign minister, been many, uh, several times in the Faroe Islands and Greenland discussing of course, with my governmental partners, but also with the parliaments about uh, what we see and what the challenges are. So we believe in this respectful, inclusive uh, approach uh, where we, we need to face the security environment together because there are changes in the Arctic, no doubt. Uh, we see more activities, also military activities, that we have to be aware of and we have to protect our interests uh, as sovereign nations, Greenland, Faroe Islands, and and Denmark, so that is the idea, and I think it works well. Um, but we're always improving and learning uh, also from each other. So let's take one more question. If anybody raises their hand very quickly. Yes, there, please. Okay. So, Minister, thank you very much for your fine talk. Uh, my name is Trusty, Trusty Valson. I am a Professor Emeritus of Planning at the University of Iceland. I gave a talk this morning no, come on, let's get the question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because we are running out of time. Okay. Yes. Uh, the, the talk was uh, Plan B. Um, if the warming cannot be stopped, I think that uh, this needs plan uh, needs to be done. And uh, do you think Denmark or the Arctic Council can, uh, can have a role in initiating this necessary Plan B for the planet? Thank you. B for the planet. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, if the warming cannot be stopped, uh, I'm not saying it's terrible and we should try to do everything you can in, to stop them, but in every big project there is always a plan B. And we in Iceland are working on it. It's actually... Yeah. So, so, I'm sorry, time is running out. We've got the question. Yes, sure. plan B. Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we should have I mean, plan B. We cannot move to another planet. I mean, we need, I think we need to deal with it now. And everything we have to do up to COP26 in Glasgow, we need to raise ambitions. But not only that, we also need to show in practical terms that we can deliver on uh, you know, reducing emissions and staying within 1.5 degrees. Uh, that is, of course, the, the boundary that we have. If we do not achieve that, then I don't know what we will do, because then we will leave a planet for our kids and grandkids that we, that, that this is, um, of course, a, a catastrophe, and, and we should not get there. I think we have our, our generation of politicians, uh, also business leaders, investors, all of us, civil society, we have now a very urgent responsibility to deliver, and, and this is something my government is very keen on, and we are working with everybody who shares this ambition. We have no, we, we do not, want a plan B, we want to deliver on plan A. Thank you. Great, Minister. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, let me just, before we leave the States, uh, remind all of you, as I said in my opening welcoming remarks, we have a great addition to the program in the plenary sessions, the opening session. Because just after this coffee break, Senator Whitehouse, one of the most distinguished members of the US Senate, has come straight from Washington to deliver a speech and answer questions on the U.S. role in the climate battle. It's a rare opportunity to hear the leading spokesman in the U.S. Senate for a number of years on the climate question. 
uh, address uh, an Arctic audience and take your question. So can I respectfully ask all of you to be back here in 15 minutes? In 15 minutes, we will start promptly, and then we will also take the other sessions on Korea, the Faroe Islands, uh, and Russia. So in 15 minutes, please be back. Thank you very much, Minister, for presenting this case. Thank you very much.